Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking my hosts. Uh, first, my friend Odette Israeli, who invited me to speak today, and from whom I've learned a great deal over the years from his treatment of rabbinic legends in the hands of the authorship of Sefer Hazor. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Department of Jewish Thought and its head, Boaz Hus, whose graciousness and scholarship is one of the Nechatz de Chakla, have been enormously helpful to me. Uh, and there are so many people uh, either here or in this department from whom I've learned over the years, either in person or from their writings. Professors Lasker, who wrote me, couldn't be here, uh, Kreisel, Gris, Ehrlich, um, and old friends uh, Didi Kedari and Nicham Ross. Last but not least, um, I don't see her here. I owe a deep debt to Dr. Shifra Regev, whose illuminating doctoral dissertation uh, is an in-depth study of the treatment of Shir Shirim in the Zohar, uh, which is what... Sulim. Is an in-depth study of the treatment of Shir Shirim in the Zohar with a main section devoted to the Zohar on Shir Shirim. Lastly, it's important to understand that while I'm doing my own work, unsupervised, except for having a brilliant copy editor who maintains a certain consistency over the entire translation, Daniel Matt has already completed six and a half of the 12 volumes of the, tr of the translation of the entire Zohar, and I'm very much guided by the style that he's established. He's been a continuing resource and mentor on this project, and to be sure, there are ways in which our style will differ, but in the end, there is an aspiration for the volumes to feel as if they are stylistically consistent. In short, the work is mine, but in many ways is his brainchild. Let's begin. Katpira, Kesira, Kirta, Kuspita, Kustra, and those are just the ones that begin with the letter Kuf. These strange words, neologisms actually, are sprinkled throughout the Zohar with an intention to perplex the reader forcing her to read, and read again, to decipher the text's meaning. While I'm now well on my way writing volume 11 of the Zohar, the Pritzker edition, my first few months were filled with trepidation. The vocabulary of the average English-speaking college graduate, and of course I'm not just a college graduate, is anywhere from 25,000 to 60,000 words. Compare that to Sefer HaZohar, which is limited to, at most, a few thousand. If one were to translate literally from the Aramaic to the English, the result would be not just monotonous, but downright pedestrian and boring. On the other hand, if one uses, say, 15 words to translate the word tikkun, or ila'a, or nehora, or so many other words that are important words that are repeated, is one still writing a translation, or has it now become a different book? In asking the question, conservation, transformation, or revelation, I intend to raise the perennial question about translation, whether it's possible at all, through a careful analysis of some of the issues that have presented themselves up to now in my work. There will be four parts to my talk today. There had, let me explain, there had to be four parts because there are so many Merkavot in Zohar and Shir Shirim that if they, I would have left out a part, then it would have been a Kitsutz and Itiot. It would have been a terrible thing. The, the Merkava is coming down next week. Uh, it was very important for you know, us to have exactly the numbers right. First, I'd like to briefly sketch out the scope of my project. Next, I'll describe how I construct the Zoharic text on the basis of manuscript evidence that will be the basis of my translation. I'll then turn to some of the issues that have arisen in the course of preparing the Aramaic text. Finally, and the main part of today's talk, I'll describe the kinds of stylistic challenges that present themselves when translating a text of such enigmatic beauty. I will spare you the story of how Margot Pritzker a member of the Pritzker family of Chicago, owner of Hyatt Hotels, philanthropist to Jewish causes, Ch Chicago cultural causes, international women's education projects, came to sponsor a project that began in 1997 and has kept Daniel Matt and an assistant busy since then. As of this past September, Natan Wolski and I are laboring full time on the project for the next few years, and together, or rather, Individually, we will be preparing the last three volumes of the projected 12 volumes, 
Presently, I'm working on volume 11, which will comprise Midrash HaNe'elam on Shir HaShirim, Ruth and Eicha, the Zohar on Shir HaShirim, and then the sections Matanitin, Tosefta, and Sitre Torah. Um, much of the material comes from a volume called Zohar Chadash, but I think I'm going to pass on that history for the sake of time. It's important to know from the start, there are no complete manuscripts of the Zohar. And it's almost certain that there never were, there never was a complete manuscript of the Zohar. While there is relative stability to the many manuscripts, they are frequently chock full of scribal errors, different arrangements. Um, and so finding an original or even a best manuscript at all stages of this project has proven elusive. Daniel Matt's decision, which has directed my translation as well, is to produce not a diplomatic text. In other words, not to say, here's going to be our base, Ketav Yad, and we will mark the Shinu Yegir Chilufei Gir based on that, but rather to produce a critical, eclectic text. What we are trying to do, what I am trying to do, is provide, in Matt's words, quote, a newly constructed, precise text of the Zohar based on original manuscripts. In his original preface, and since then in various places in print and in talks, he's claimed to be trying to remove accumulated layers of revision, thereby restoring a more, these are his words, a more original text to recover the Zohar's primal texture and cryptic flavor. Unquote. Sadly, I'm not as optimistic about getting to something much more original or primal. Following Daniel Abrams' exhaustive treatment of the editorial practices of Zoharic manuscripts and printing, it feels implausible to harbor the hope that we might get to a more original text, with some of its primal texture and cryptic flavor recovered. Returning to Danny Matt's original description that I offered, a newly constructed precise text of the Zohar, based on original manuscripts, when it can also say, we are creating a Zohar that has never existed before. And yet, in the end, this is not so different from what the printers did in piecing together a text from different manuscripts, trying to put together what makes sense and at every stage of the game, trying to put together something that will read like a book. Right now, I'm working on Zohar Shir Shirim, and there are eight more or less complete manuscripts that I'm using to reconstruct the Zoharic text. Of these, three have suffered a great deal of damage and so do not play as big a role. Dr. Yonatan Benarosh compiles lift, lists of manuscript variants of Chilufei Nuskaot using the standard printed edition, Margaliot's edition, published by Masada Rav Kook, as the base text. I proceed, starting with Margaliot, making a decision every time a variant arises. <coughs> All of my kitveyad, all of my manuscripts, are 16th century. All have many, many scribal errors, though some are worse than others. Cambridge one, every time there is a, a shinuach uh, gersa, I know it's wrong. Um, and uh, I could tell you about each one of them. I'll, I'll spare you that exciting uh, rundown. <coughs> when several manuscripts offer a plausible alternative, I have to ask, which version is likely to be earlier? Which version is conceptually clearer, and therefore perhaps a gloss on an earlier, more difficult reading? Sometimes one will be an Arama Aramaized form of the Hebrew. What's the meaning in that situation, when one version is in Hebrew, one version is in Aramaic? Once I've made my decisions and marked up my text accordingly, and you're welcome to come take a look at my uh, text that has uh, the new Zohar. This is it says Zohar Chadash on the on the cover, and this is Mamasha Zohar Chadash. Um, now that I've I've been Mitzchadesh the Zohar Chadash, um, I proceed with the translation, and after the translation, the commentary. I'm not going to be speaking about the commentary today, just the translation. The text then is eclectic, merging various versions together, seeking to produce a clear and to the greatest extent possible accurate text of the Zohar. My aim is to produce a coherent text, a text that can be translated into English. 
And that then is going to, to drive certain kinds of decisions. Um, if you have a verb one time in a plural form, and then right after that in a singular form, well, did the subject change? Very often it's not the case. So do I go with the plural form? Do I go with the singular form? Those are the kinds of issues that will come up, and I will give more examples as we move on. Um, in terms of decision-making, the text that emerges often has more Hebrew than later manuscripts. One of the features that Ronit Meroz and Danny Matt have observed is the historical process of an Aramization of the text. Later manuscripts tend to have more Aramaic than earlier ones. So whenever several have a Hebrew form of a word rather than Aramaic, I choose the Hebrew. The text that emerges is often also rougher, a little wilder, than the printed edition because of the, print, of the principle of lectio difficilior potior. That is, that the more difficult reading is the correct one. I've started with the translation with Zohar Shir Shirim, whose manuscripts are all from the 16th century, quite late, very close to the stabilization of the text that occurs with printing in the 16th century. Here I want to acknowledge Boaz Hus's important study, one chapter in his Zohar Rakia, a chapter called Likute Batar Likute, showing how unstable and fluid the form of the Zoharic text is through the various printings. That was in an earlier Gilgul when he was a Zohar scholar. <laughs> uh, let me give several examples of issues that come up in the course of preparing the texts from variants. One of the things, one of the themes that the Zohar Shir Shirin is very interested in is, is letter mysticism. Secrets associated with the letters, Nikudim, Nikudot, and particular subgroups of letters. It all begins with the verse. Mashcheni acharecha narutza, heviani hamelech hararav, Nagila v'nismecha bach, in which the word bach, bet, kaf, is understood to refer to the, to the kaf, bet, letters of the alphabet. In a drasha that talks about the letters menatzapach, mem nun sari pechaf, five letters who have final forms, it says that there was a secret tradition about these letters known by Adam Rishon. When Adam sinned, these letters flew upward, concealed until someone else would appear that would be worthy to possess knowledge of them. Avram Avinu comes along, the secret is transmitted to him through Ruach HaKodesh, passed on to Yitzchak and Yaakov. When the Jews then were in exile, the secret was concealed again, only to be to returned to them at Har Sinai. They sin, and it's removed again. Khan <coughs> At this point in the narrative, the Zohar writes, and... Uh, it's, you can take a look at your first source uh, on the sheet. Kevan de Chatu, Ktiv, Vait Natslub Ne Israel et Odiam. And once they sinned, it is written, and the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments. What is the jewelry that Bnei Israel removed in the course of fashioning the golden calf? Well, of course, it's the secrets of the letters. The phrasing here shifts in different manuscripts. The Margalio text reads, Kevan de Chatu, Ktiv Vait Natslu Bnei Israel et Ediam, but, based on several Kitve Yad, it includes in brackets the words Istalku, ascended or flew away, so that the text would now read, Kevan de Chatu Istalaku, Ktiv Vait Natslu Bnei Israel et Ediam. The two end up, I'd suggest, having very different meanings. Even without spelling it out, it's clear that the mystery of these letters has vanished again. The word istalaku has two effects. One, it clarifies and smooths out the meaning. Very often in Zohar Kitve Yad manuscripts, words are added by copyists for this purpose, to make it easier on the reader. Here, though, the, the second effect is a loss in poetic power. Kevan de Chatu, allows the pasuk itself to do the explanatory work. In fact, what happens is that the Torah's words themselves are the response to the sin. With the word istalaku added, the verse serves only as a proof text, only to substantiate that uh, such and such happened. Even if I prefer the version without the extra word, 
as I do, by what license may I choose one over the other? Each of the Kitve Yad, or each of these collections of Kitve Yad, are quite or is quite flawed, having meaningless typos on a regular basis, indicating that they were written by someone with a poor background. Some have missed lines on a regular basis. Others, however, Paris 13 in particular, have a more stripped down style, a little less verbose, a little less hand holding for the reader. As a result, this manuscript has become my favorite, my guide, my manche, often quite seeming more reliable, not overcooked, and he was the one that swayed me in this particular choice, leaving out that extra word. Another example of the same phenomenon, also in the same column in the, in the Zohar, follows right afterwards. This is in source number two. <clears throat> the printed text reads, but Moshe, Yoshua, and, and the 70 elders knew them, that is, those secrets of Menatzpach, entering the land with them. Several of the best manuscripts have a different reading. It re they, instead of reading Veshivim Zkenim, it reads Veinun Zkenim, and those elders. My assumption here is that Veinun Zkenim struck copyists as being a little strange. Who are, why those elders? We know who the elders are. They're the Shivim Skenim. And odds are that the Shivim was put in as a substitute in order to clarify and to remind us, well, we all know who these are. It's not those. That's not a very mechubad way to talk about those Skenim. It's not a spelling error. It's rather a decision by a copyist to give a more correct version. To be sure, these are not big differences but they show a little bit of the kind of clearing away that I'm involved in. Source number three we'll spend a little bit more time with. It says, as it's reviewing a series of, it's looking, what it does is it looks at the letters Yud, va, yud Vav, Zayn, and Nun. Each one of them, uh, or rather none of them, allowing any white spaces to enter within them. It says, Ba'alda at Zayn, and then we have either bakol or mikol. If it was kol, if it had the version of kol as well, it might have been birkat mazon, but we're doing something else here. Um, uh, so it's either bakol or mikol sha'ar umin, uzminin la'agcha karva besof yomin bakol umin da'alma. On Zion, it's tents of kedar, all waging war coming from all the other nations, poised to engage in combat at the end of days with all other nations of the world. I want to show you the inner guts of the work. So you, what you see there in the next line are the chilufei nusach that were available to me. So we have two alt alternate propositions, sorry, two alternate <coughs> prepositions, either a bet or a mem. Cambridge 1, Cambridge 10, Paris 13, Parma 13, and uh, the Ramak, Cordovero, all have a mem, Mikol. Trinity College and Vatican 23 don't have anything there. What happened? Perhaps their sources had a blank, hoping to fill it in when they had greater clarity. Perhaps originally there was no word there, and others supplied the Bakol and the Mikol. But the only one that has Bakol is Salonika, the, which was a, um, an early printed edition of Zohar Hadash, and it's a terribly corrupt text. In the end, yes, I'm following Margaliot's choice, though obviously there are many times that I'm not. Either way, though, the majority of the texts have a version that suggests a defensive war, Israel against the nations. All the nations will attack, and the central six Sfirot will respond. Hopefully it's not talking about September in this particular, uh, you know, drasha. But consider the implications between these two different versions. Is this war at the end of days a defensive war or an offensive war? Do we seek out the apocalyptic climax of history? Or as in 1967, are we responding to the axis of evil forcefully and decisively? consider the possibility that Salonika did have a source, that there was a manuscript that had that reading, 
and that the others actually reflect an anxiety-driven response. That, the, that that manuscript, with that aggressiveness, that we were going to go take on all the nations, was the, the earlier version. And what the other ones are doing is they are responding with a certain amount of temerity, anxiety, saying, well, if they all come at us, then we'll take them on. But otherwise, we're not going after them. One of the things that we've learned particularly from Daniel Abrams' recent massive book is the way in which Kabbalistic texts were reworked and reworked so that without being unable to recover their history, we don't really know what they said. In this case, I had to go with what all of the Kitve Yad were, uh, were saying. Source number four. On the verses from Shir HaShirim, uh, and here I wanted to quote from uh, Sukim Hey and Vav, I printed for you Dalit and Hey, but it's the words, Shchora ani v'na'ava, not Yerushalayim, al tiruni shani shchachoret. The Zohar offers a series of drashot explaining why Shchina says that Benot Yerushalayim should not look at her. So why should Benot Yerushalayim not look at the Shechina? Well, it could be that she's being oppressed by the Sitra Achra, so she can't be seen. Or she can't be seen because there's an, a greater overflow from Gvura. Other explanations as well, but primarily the Benot Yerushalayim symbolize the angels who will get jealous if they see beauty coming from below from all of the tikkunim done by Bnei Yisrael through uh, Limut Torah, uh, Mitzvot, V'chule. Therefore, she says, don't look at me. Don't look at the part of me that will upset you. I'm not beautiful down there. Actually, I'm pitch black. Uh, really, um, uh, my light comes from above. Yeah, that's right. Most of the manuscripts and printed versions have a line that goes, and here I quote, since she is like a mother over here, this is from my translation. Um, since she is like a mother over her children regarding Israel, the most graceful and beautiful ornament of all, from the side of that lower collectivity on whose account she ascends upwards, she removes them. And in the Aramaic, the word for removes there is mevaaram, from the view of troops outside, so that they will neither be envious nor denounce Israel. For this reason. Al tiruni shanish charchoret. Do not look upon this adornment. Ki ani charchoret, shanish charchoret. In the Oryakar version, Cordovero's version of the text follows a couple of the manuscripts. We see a very interesting variant. Instead of the word mevaaram, it has the word mechaaram, which would mean to disfigure, or to make ugly, to describe Shekhinah's methods for protecting Israel. Is the Shekhinah merely removing them, or is the Shekhinah actually somehow disfiguring them, making them ugly? According to Cordovero and these two other manuscripts, Shekhinah enfolds Israel within Klipot to conceal the true beauty she attains through them. The difference between a chaf and a bet is obviously very small but the ramifications here again are considerable. Does Shekhinah somehow make Israel invisible, less prominent, or does she actually make the Jews look bad, physically, ethically, arousing the disdain of others? It's interesting to me because it may be raising the question of theodicy. To what extent will God make Israel look bad in order to protect them? If so, is there a specific instance that Cordovero had in mind? If not, is there a particular style of disfigurement that the divinity imposes on a routine basis? In other words, was Bernie Madoff something that happened to us so that the angels wouldn't get jealous of all the good things that we do in the world? Let me shift now from looking at um, the way the translation gets driven by uh, decisions about um, uh, variance between manuscripts to talk about translation style. Uh, Matt has often characterized his style as literal yet poetic. Let me cite briefly from his translator's introduction, quote, though I wish to make the Zohar accessible, I also want to convey its strangeness, poet potency, and rich ambiguity. My style of translation is literal yet poetic. I'm convinced 
that a literal rendering, rendering of the Zohar is not only the most accurate, but also the most colorful and zestful, the best way to transmit the lyrical energy of the Aramaic. On the one hand, one wants neither to improve upon the text, nor to, nor to paraphrase, nor to recast the Zohar. These are my words uh, again. On the, one, on the other hand, one of the problems in creating a translation is that there's no such thing as a word-for-word -word translation. No two languages correspond so neatly that one could pull off this feat. This is very much the case with Zoharic Aramaic and English. As I noted at the outset, there's a great discrepancy between its vocabulary and my own. Moreover, because Aramaic is a Semitic language based on a system of roots, every word can be turned into a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb. English is beginning to work that way a little bit in ways that feels a little bit awkward, but it doesn't have its very basis in that kind of linguistic behavior. What English does have, though, is verbal richness. The question arises, should terms that appear frequently be translated, such as tikkun, ila'a, nihiro, be translated uniformly, <coughs> using the same term over and over? Or do we now have, in English, opportunities for precision and nuance so that we can actually look carefully at what exactly is the meaning in this drush, in that drush, and try to nail down that meaning as precisely as possible in a way that would suit the English reader. In his book, After Babel, Aspects of Language and Translation, George Steiner delineates four stages of the enterprise of translation, the last being called compensation. In Steiner's words, compensation is the very essence of the work and the morals of translation. What is that compensation? <laughs> Recognizing that there's aggression and appropriation in the act of translating, he argues that a good translation will compensate the text for this assault. This compensation is not to be regarded as an improvement upon the text. That would be hubris. Rather, it's an attempt to be generous to the text and supply nuance, information, or acuity in the target language. While the second century Rebbe Yehuda cautions that one who translates a verse literally is a liar, one who adds to it is a blasphemer. What compensation seeks to do is find fidelity and an ironic awareness of its distance from the original. So there are several ways in which I'm using compensation as a method in my translation. The easiest ways to compensate are through punctuation, layout, typographical means. The standard printed edition contains periods every once in a while and quite infrequently will have paragraph breaks or other markers to signify transition from one drush shot to another. Although you, you, can, you can see here that paragraph breaks are very few and uh, there's very little punctuation. And ba while it's a little bit better than it is in the Talmud, basically you have to figure out where things are beginning and ending. Um, earlier translations into Hebrew and French have done much of that work. But among the things that, that you'll find in, in, uh, in my uh, translation is the use of the dash. Dash is a simple line. Um, but what it does is it, is it replaces words such as inun, they, da, this, elaine, these. And what, it do, what that does is it has the effect of compressing and tightening the text and giving more punch to the style. Shortly we'll see a couple of examples. Another thing is simply the addition of exclamation marks. The dialogue of the Zohar's fictional Kabbalists is frequently punctuated with expressions of astonishment, delight, dismay. Oh, I only came into the world for this. Oh, really, you're the greatest Tamil Chacham of all time. Oh, really, I'm such a dolt because I didn't realize that, etc., etc. Um, very often, the Zohar uses the words vadai or mamash as technical terms signaling the transparency of the mundane world to the supernal world. And from a hermeneutical perspective, an overlapping of exoteric and esoteric signification. At the end of a sentence, they are always emphatic, followed by an exclamation mark to signify that a dramatic transition between realms is occurring. Um, I'm going to look at uh, source number five, and from, simply because of time, I'm going to, to skip the Aramaic and just read the translations. Not only they, even the celestial supernal ones all offer praise on account of Israel. More than that, 
He is exalted in his glory because of Israel, in actuality. More than that, even Israel, in actuality, soars in the glory of the Blessed Holy One, above and below. What the exclamation marks help to do is to get a little bit of the breathless quality that the Zohar often has as it rushes from one open-sounding word to another one. It sort of carries you and makes you feel as if, or tries to make you feel as if you are soaring along with it. Another method is alliteration, where you use uh, a poetic, um, not rhyming, but rather where you, you'll use the same letter over and over as a way of creating a certain kind of poetic feel. So if you'll take a look at source number six, and here I will, we'll actually read the, uh, the Aramaic, all sublime delicacies descended into all worlds, all rejoicing. So even as I was going up preparing this for today, I was thinking, there's got to be a way I could get more alliteration in there. Is that just having the all and the all and the all uh, isn't quite enough. In another one, uh, in the, um, the very next source. Let me see if you've got this one. I don't think so. Um, yes, yeah, so if you just take a look at the English here, in source number seven, Abel's power and potency were shattered. He was nothing in comparison. If you take a look at the, at the Aramaic there, the words I translated as power and potency are chela and utokpa. There's not a strong alliteration there. And yet, even where there isn't alliteration, I've supplied it because I'm not always going to be able to supply the alliteration where the Zohar has intended it. And so there's going to be other places where I can do it in the English, and so I will put it in. Um, take a look now at source um, number, I think we'll pass uh, source number seven. Let's take a look at one of the other prominent methods that we're using um, for the, for, uh, in the translation style. Very often in the Zohar, you will get a series of infinitives. The itchabra, la a'ala, la istalka. And um, there's a way in which, in English, the participle gives a, which is a word that ends with the, letter, with the, words, with the letters ing, walking, running, trying, writing, gives a greater dynamism than the infinitive to write, to run, to walk, etc. And so very often what I've done is, and in this way following Dan, Danny and Matt, uh, is change them. So if you take a look then at source number nine, um, they would prevent her from ascending above, uniting with her husband. Here are both the words of the salka and lit kabra return from infinitive form to participle, increasing the dynamism. In source number 10, where there's yet another series of uh, infinitives, um, I've, I've written final hay, we're t now talking of course about the final hay of the, of sh the Shem HaMeforash, has nothing of her own, and so lacks her own vowel unless she is made a messenger. When they lend her one vowel, answering her, forming troops and force, as they lend her a vowel entering, entering into her, so too do they lend her letters of the exalted mystery, perfecting her through this mission. Now let, we, let me uh, turn to what I think is perhaps the most interesting and exciting part of the translating work. And that is trying to come up with the precise term. And not just the precise term, but the sparkling term, the one that will add some of the glisten, some of the sheen, some of the shimmer that the Zohar itself has. This is where things get really fun. So if you take a look at source number 13, we have the line. Uh, this is... Um, uh, right after Cain has been born as a result of her being inseminated by the Nachash. Bahava Ashkachat Bahai, she's looking down at Cain, the Amrat, Kaniti Ish et Hashem, Im Hashem. 
So what is this word va'ashkachat? What is Chava doing exactly? She's looking, she's observing, she's staring, she's gazing, she's supervising, right? She's giving hashkacha, she comes from the Rabbanut. Now, what exactly is it she's, she's doing here? What she's, what's just happened here? She's just had a demon child. I don't know if people have seen the movie Rosemary's Baby, but here is this kid that has come from the devil. And so really what she is doing is what you do when you see a car wreck. She's doing what, when, what is called in, back in the States, rubbernecking. That is, she's gawking. She's staring at something very strange in amazement. Hence my translation, Eve gawked at this one, saying, I've created a man, etc. Earlier on, I referred to the problem that sometimes we'll get the same word being repeated over and over again. So I'd like to read this next passage, uh, uh, number 14, and show you one of the solutions that I, I came up with for it. Tachazeh. Bishata d'Israel zakayin kursa yikara v'le'ela, istalik le'ela le'ela b'kama chedvan, b'kama rochimo m'nitzchabran almin v'chedvan. V'chulahu yitbarchan ma'amika d'nachlin, v'almin kulahu ishtakyan v'yitbarchan, v'yitkadshan, b'kama b'chaan b'kama kidushin, over and over and over again, we see this word, this word, um, kama, kama, is the word that I'm drawing attention to. Now, we could have translated it as numerous, numerous this, numerous that, etc. It's not, it doesn't have the same uh, lightness that the word kama has. So instead, what I wrote was the following. And I have to confess that this is one of my favorite paragraphs that I've written so far. Um, come and see. When Israel are righteous, the supernal throne of glory ascends in teeming delight, in an abundance of love, higher and higher. All worlds are saturated, blessed, and sanctified with a profusion of blessings, brimming with sanctities. Then the Blessed Holy One rejoices with them in total rapture. Here, by using a series of adjectives, teeming, abundant, profusion, brimming. I've tried to capture the plenitude that the language itself is suggesting. Aramaic style of ending with open-mouthed vowel sounds, though here it's the Hebrew hey that the word is ending with, gives an expansive feeling that repetition in English wouldn't supply. Um, one of the other methods that we, oh, here I'll show you uh, uh, one other term, or tell you about one other term that I've, uh, that I described, that I uh, uh, translated in a way that felt particularly uh, uh, pleasing for me, is it says, Kulahu a'alu, go, and I don't think I have this on the, uh, on the source sheet, Kulahu a'alu go nukba to Tahoma Rabba, that they all went into a nukba to Tahoma Rabba, they all went into a Orifice, an opening, a gap of the great depths. So I could have translated one of those as in one of those ways, and yet I used the word maw, M-A-W. If you look up the word maw in the dictionary, and what was ha here, let me just describe what's happening here, is this is describing something like uh, the end of Shabbat, when all of the demons get sucked back down into, their, into the Tzahoma Rabbah, what the word maw means is the mouth or stomach of an animal, especially of a voracious animal. Or it means the mouth or stomach of a greedy person. Or it means a trap. And so there was a way in which this, this three-letter word maw was able to catch so, capture so much more of what the Zohar actually was talking about with its nukba to Tahoma Rabbah. One other one is that in referring to the, uh, the Tzvilin Shalyad, which is put on the Yad Kahe, which is usually translated as the weak hand. I instead translated it as the dull hand, because what dull does is it suggests both the lack of vigor and the dimness, the lack of light that is being talked about in the Zohar in that particular instance. There are um, 
lots of other ways that, that, we, that we use in terms of tightening syntax through uh, dropping verbs to dropping, uh, not dropping nouns, but dropping various kinds of words as a way of sort of tightening things up to try to enhance the visual experience for the reader. There are, of course, things that are lost. Uh, one of the ones is that the, the word, uh, there's a, a whole discussion of how the shir, of shir hashirim comes to be. And where it comes from are the places on the Mizbeach where the, the blood used to drip down, which in, which in the original are called shitin. And so each one of those, each sheet would translate, would be transformed from a sheet into a shear. Now, the wonderful thing, of course, about doing this in English is that I could joke on my Facebook page and say and tell them that I was tr translating shit into sheer on a regular basis. Um, uh, that perhaps won't work, you know, doesn't work in the Aramaic. But, the, but there, there is something just about being able to, about thinking in Hebrew or thinking in Aramaic and visualizing the letters and seeing how a shin yud tough get trans, gets transformed into a shin yud resh and how one is something that is drawing down, whereas one is leading to something higher up, these are things that can't be fully replicated when one changes languages. languages. Another one is that uh, at a certain point, the Zohar talks about the Shechina as one of the Ofanim, and drawing on the language of Yechezkel, it refers to uh, a pen chad, and it's, it talks about a, a, a pan chad, finally saying, o fun, which pan, meaning which face. And so there's a whole series of puns that are taking place here that I can describe in the notes, and I do, um, but that again is going to be lost, and there's, there's very little way to capture it. I want to close by reminding us all of the story um, in Megillah of how the Septuagint was created, and that 72 rabbis were locked in a room, and that through some kind of miraculous phenomenon, every single one of them produced not just exactly the same translation, but even the same intentional mistakes. Um, and in another place, we have the note, so there, that would seem to suggest that translation is impossible. The only way that it can be done is with Ruach HaKodesh. And in fact, Masechet Sofrim suggests that the translation of the Torah into Greek was comparable to the worship of the golden calf. At lunch, somebody you know, referred to me as the, as the Tzelem Behechal, so perhaps I'm the right man for the job. Um, but the question is, why is there such a harsh assessment of the translator's craft? And the problem is that people fall too much into the trap of literalism, of thinking that what needs to be done is some kind of word-for-word -word translation. Hopefully what we are doing, what I'm doing in translating this, first in establishing a text, translating, commenting on this text, is not merely making the Zohar available to the English reading public, but also giving it new legs. Also shining a different kind of light on it, or rather opening up its doors so that some of its own light can shine forth in a new way, a kind of milin atikin chadatin that hopefully the Zohar itself would be proud of. Thank you.